We're number two in Washington. Not a great distinction to have, but a distinction nonetheless. Second only to California in terms of risk of property damage or loss of life from earthquakes. Now, one of the reasons why earthquakes are prevalent in Washington is because we have three source mechanisms for earthquakes, or you can say three types of earthquakes. We'll start in the middle, kind of the classic textbook example. If you ever took Geology 101, you may have learned this type of earthquake where we have the Cascadia subduction zone. Basically, the crust of the Earth is made up of plates. Those plates all move relative to one another. The Juan de Fuca plate actually moving underneath the North American plate. Every once in a while, the North American plate gives, and with that will come an earthquake. Now, with that Juan de Fuca plate, there's actually bending here deep below the surface of western Washington. This is the second type of earthquake. These Deep earthquakes are caused as cracks in this plate actually create faults on their own. Those faults can also rupture, creating earthquakes. And this was the same type of earthquake more than 20 years ago that was responsible for the Nisqually earthquake. And then another type of earthquake, totally different sourcing, lateral forces in other parts of the country. You can see these lines here, uh, different type of shallow faults creating earthquakes as well. Now, because the process of earthquakes and everything behind them is so complicated in Washington, I employed the help of Harold Do Tobin. He's the director of the uh, Pacific Northwest Seismic Network, and he's here to talk with me on basically how and why earthquake ha earthquakes happen and what you can do to stay safe from them. Okay, so very briefly, uh, yeah. Pacific Northwest earthquakes and threat for earthquakes. Is it like in, unlike any other place in the rest of the country? Well, it really is different in certain ways. So um, we are actually um, a high hazard region for earthquakes because they're, you know, we, we know we can have them. We have had them historically pretty often. Um, <coughs> excuse me, sorry. Um, the, uh, um, we, we sit on a subduction zone. Alaska is similar in terms of being a subduction zone, but of course there aren't very many people in harm's way, relatively speaking, in Alaska um, compared to the Northwest. We're not exactly like California with the San Andreas Fault, which probably has a higher risk of earthquakes happening, but really second only to California is Washington State in terms of the risk for, of damage and uh, loss of life from earthquakes in the U.S. Okay, would you say uh, briefly we are quote unquote due for an earthquake in any capacity? We could have an earthquake, of course, at any time, a damaging earthquake. We had the Nisqually earthquake in 2001, but before that, there were similar earthquakes in 1965 and 1949. We also have the, the offshore potential for the really big one, uh, the magnitude, you know, eight to nine scale earthquake, uh, which isn't overdue, but certainly could come at any time. And there are other faults as well, like the Seattle fault. So we've got three different kinds of sources for big earthquakes here. Earthquakes are rare. They, you know, they don't come very often, but when they do, they come without much warning. Okay. So these three uh, types of earthquakes, is it fair to call them types of earthquakes? I think yes, absolutely. Okay. Can you briefly talk about how each one is different? Yeah, absolutely. So the three types of earthquakes that we have, um, we, we live on a subduction zone, a place where one plate dives beneath the other plate. In this case, it's the Pacific Ocean floor. That's the Juan de Fuca plate, and it's the North American plate. So the boundary between those two plates is locked up, we know it, and it could have the very, very large earthquake, up to magnitude nine kind of scale. That's the big one. That's the Cascadia subduction zone earthquake with the potential for a big tsunami. But okay. in addition to that, we have um, earthquakes that happen inside the lower plate after it's kind of gone underneath the continent. So directly below our feet in Seattle, 40 miles down or so, um, there's the these what we call slab earthquakes or just deep earthquakes like uh, Nisqually in 2001. And then the third type are what we call crustal earthquakes, shallow earthquakes that happen inside the North American plate. And that's what the Seattle Fault, the Tacoma Fault, the South Whidbey Island Fault and others are, are those kinds of faults that are just caused the deformation of the North American plate as it kind of crunches up with the uh, Juan de Fuca plate. Okay. Is there evidence of these? If I'm just out sightseeing, can I see evidence of these faults? Yeah. The, um, uh, uh, the landscape of Seattle, you know, as you go south from Seattle and you get into a little bit of, of higher hills going down towards where the airport is, you've literally crossed the Seattle Fault, and that controls that difference um, between the lower ground um, around the city and then the higher ground to the south. 
Um, but in addition, the ge as geologists, we can find evidence of these faults and actually places where they can literally dig a trench across the fault and see the offset of soil layers. That's the telltale sign of prehistoric earthquakes. So we call it paleoseismology, uh, the study of something that we don't have a, a record of, a written record of, but we have a geologic record of. Um, okay. The same holds true, I should say, for the, um, for the Pacific coast, the outer coast of Washington, where there are a number of places in the kind of mud flats of the, of the coastal zone where we can see evidence of past tsunamis, one in 1700, 324 years ago, and then several others stacked up older than that as well. Okay. All right. Of these three types of earthquakes, which one, A, tends to be the strongest, and then B, which one, if you had a crystal ball, I know it's difficult to predict earthquakes if we can even do it at all, but mm -hmm. which one would you anticipate would be the first type of earthquake mm -hmm. to actually um, rupture? Is that the right word, rupture? Sure, rupture. Yeah, the the um, we, we can't predict earthquakes, but what we can do is forecast the likelihood that they'll come in the future based on the past records, right? So for sure, the next earthquake we're likely to feel, most likely to feel, is one like Nisqually, another sort of 6.6 to 7 sized earthquake that comes from a little bit deep but beneath the Puget Sound region. That is most likely the next one because we've seen one like that every 20 to 30 years throughout the 20th century and up to 2001, and we haven't had one since then. Um, the largest by far would be the one between the two plates, the Cascadia subduction zone earthquake. That's going to rupture at some point in time. We think it has on average an interval between earthquakes of about 500 years. It's been 324, but the 500 is an average. It's not a metronome, you know, so okay. it's been as little as probably two or 300 years and as much as maybe 800 years. And we really don't know. That earthquake could happen literally tomorrow and it wouldn't be a surprise, but it could also be, you know, a century or more in the future and also wouldn't be a surprise. Okay. Elastic rebound theory. Does that apply here? Does that mean the longer we wait, the worse it will be when it happens? All other things being equal, yes, the elastic rebound theory is real. It means that, you know, the faults lock up, they're stuck, they accumulate that sort of um, stuckness, just like, you know, the further back an archer pulls a bow, the more the bow is bent and, the you know, the faster the arrow will fly when they finally let go. But, uh, but all other things aren't completely equal. We can have ruptures that don't completely release the strain of that elastic strain that's in the crust um, so that we could have partial ones. That might be a smaller earthquake, but maybe they come more often, um, or a really complete and total release of that strain, and that would be a larger earthquake. Um, having said all that complexity, yes, the longer we wait, the bigger the earthquake ultimately can be, but that's really measured in centuries, you know, not, not okay. sort of years. Yeah. And, and that would apply to the deep and shallow earthquakes as well? In principle, yes. We know less about the deep earthquakes and how much of the net total possible strain that they release. So uh, it's a little hard to tell how big those events can be. Probably not much bigger than magnitude, sort of mid sevens. So you anticipate the next earthquake that we will feel here in mm -hmm. the Pacific Northwest or even Seattle would be a deep earthquake. What yeah. would be the likely impacts of that? Yeah. Is it possible to answer that? Um, yes, absolutely. I mean, the, you know, the model for the likely impacts of that is basically Nisqually and the other earthquakes that preceded it. So we kind of know what those look like. They are strong shaking felt over a very wide region. Because they're deep, they kind of, you know, they don't necessarily impact the epicenter any more than an area that's, say, 50 mile radius around it, um, because the seismic waves come from deep and come up to the surface and kind of hit us all at the, almost the same time. Um, We've certainly done a lot to improve the structures in our region since then. Um, we had a lot of damage in Nisqually, you know, several billion dollars worth of damage were done from the state capitol up to the viaduct, which is now finally gone and we've replaced it with a tunnel um, in Seattle. But we have a long way to go in the region. Um, there's still plenty of buildings that are substandard, unreinforced masonry buildings, you know, old stone and uh, brick buildings, uh, concrete that was built a long time ago, not as well, not as well built. And there's no guarantee that, you know, the next one might not be a little bit stronger or centered a little closer to Seattle, for example. Um, uh, so, so the damage, you know, we have to use that as essentially our guide for one of those events. Okay. But it's impossible to know how soon this could happen yeah. in terms of years or even decades. Yeah. You know, so the, the state of the art for earthquakes is, again, we do long-term forecasts and we've actually assigned some probabilities, kind of like the way you do a long-term weather forecast. We say that the chances 
sometime in the next 50 years of another deep Nisqually style earthquake are about 85%. So very okay. strong chance of that happening in the next five decades. Okay. okay. And um, that's as, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I was going to say that's as low as you can go. You don't go down any lower than five decades. Uh, generally not. There's a 30 year probability that is a little bit lower number. Okay. Uh, I think the 50 years is a, is a kind of a nice number to use. Okay. Um, the, the, the Cascadia subduction zone, you know, in contrast, our 50 year probability for that is about 15% or so. Okay. And that's just based on, we have about a 10,000 year geologic record of, of events of on average every 500 years. And it's been 325 and you can just sort of do the, the math essentially. Um, and then for the Seattle fault type earthquakes, the crustal quakes, which would actually be the worst earthquakes for us here in Seattle, the most damaging by far. That's, <coughs> excuse me, the, 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 the earthquakes on the crustal faults like the Seattle fault would be potentially the most damaging earthquakes that we would see by far, actually, because they're right here in the city, very okay. close to the surface, big potential impact. That's the bad news. The, the better news is that they seem to only come every few thousand years on any one of those faults. We think we know pretty well now that the last one, uh, or at least the last one we have a geologic record of, was in the year 923 AD. We can say down to the year because of tree ring dating. Okay. And um, so 1100 years ago. And uh, it's not so clear how often, it's not so clear how many of those faults there are. We roll that all up together with all the uncertainties and we say there's a 15% probability of one of those affecting the Puget Sound region with about a magnitude seven earthquake in the next 50 years as well. Okay. So, you know, you put it all together, we have a high probability of all of us seeing a major earthquake in our lifetime. Um, and it's just a matter of which of all of those. Now, if you ever find yourself in a situation where the earth is shaking and you think there's an earthquake, I want you to do a couple things. First off, stay calm, don't panic. And second off, don't immediately rush outside. Running outside can expose you to falling facade uh, pieces of buildings that could actually be much more dangerous than if you would have stayed inside. What we want you to do, rather, is to drop cover and hold on. If you feel the building you're in shaking, drop to the floor so you don't fall over, take cover underneath a sturdy uh, item like a, a strong table, and then hold on to a solid surface to give yourself some support. That way you can keep yourself out of harm's way, as a lot of people within buildings tend to be a lot safer than those uh, running outside during earthquakes. For now, that's a look at seismic activity in the Pacific Northwest.